any of you, I hope, will will take part. We're going to take. We're going to open it up to the floor uh, as soon as possible. So, welcome. It's good to have you. My name is uh, Mike Taylor. I'm the director of the International Land Coalition Secretariat, which is hosted by IFAD uh, in Rome. Um, and I'll introduce the panelists uh, to you in a minute. Um, but just a few words before uh, we we introduce the panelists and hear from them about what brings us together. Now, I'm sure all of you, like me, have spent many, many hours in uh, webinars over the last months on COVID-19. COVID-19 has turned our world upside down, and for all of us who work in this sector, it's been, it's been a huge, huge uh, changer of, of how we work, and uh, not just how we work, but how we see our work and how we see the future uh, of the issues that we work on. So I think that's one reason why we have, uh, we have nearly now 120 people, uh, why we have such a lot of interest uh, in this topic. Uh, and we've got a lot of excellent experience that we're gonna hear, experiences about what's not working, also what's working and, 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 and how we can, we can work better. So we're gonna, hear, we're gonna hear two sides of it. We're gonna hear the impact. Um, I mean, in terms of impact, you probably know from the, the latest uh, SOFI report that just uh, came out from uh, FAO that 690 million people uh, on this planet are undernourished. That's nearly one in 10 people. Nearly one in 10 people do not have the food that they, uh, the food that they need to survive. And what we've been told is COVID is probably going to increase that number by somewhere between 83 and 132 million people. So we have a very immediate impact. Um, there will, and that's only this year. Uh, we don't know what did, what what whole, what's held in store for 2021, 2022, 2023, and and beyond. But uh, but commentators are telling us that that the, the, there are very significant medium to long term uh, impacts as well. So I think many of us who are who are part of this session, many of you listening in in some way or another work on land rights. We know land rights is a very wide and a very cross-cutting uh, uh, issue. You may work on land rights because it's important for food security. You may work on land rights because it's important uh, for dealing with the climate crisis, for dealing with the environmental crisis. You may work on land rights because it contributes to justice uh, and equality. You may work on land rights for greater economic inclusion uh, uh, and uh, and more equal opportunity. So there are many many angles that uh, that we're coming from, and we're going to hear from many uh, from many different perspectives. But as we as we um, go into this discussion, we're gonna we're gonna look at it in two parts. In these different sectors in which we work, uh, we're gonna hear from the panelists uh, what are the impacts they're feeling as they're confronted with COVID-19, uh, the, the, the pandemic and the impacts the, of, the, of the lockdown associated uh, with the pandemics, with the pandemic. Uh, uh, firstly, and we'll go through that fairly quickly. I'll invite you, if you have comments, please put them in the, in the chat and I'd be very happy, uh, I'd be very happy to, uh, to bring in comments into the discussion as we go along. You don't need to wait until the end. Uh, to add uh, your comments. Um, uh, and then we'll go and we'll spend most of the time we have looking at, well, what do we need to do? How are land rights and our work relating to land rights part of both the short-term recovery and the long-term resilience building, particularly of food systems that are gonna get us out and not only out to where we were before, but out to a better place uh, than we were before. Okay, so that's setting the scene. Let me let me introduce uh, to you. We're going to have we're going to hear first from four panelists in the first section. Uh, I'll introduce them quickly, and then uh, so you know who to expect coming up, um, uh, and then we'll we'll let them talk. So first we have Javier uh, Molina Cruz, uh, who is the head of FAO's land tenure section, and he's also speaking in his capacity as the co-chair of the Global Donor Working Group uh, on land. We'll then go and we'll hear from Laura Mejolaro, who's the team leader at the Land Portal Foundation. The Land Portal is a leading knowledge broker and one of the most innovative digital resources in the land sector, promoting data, data exchange, dialogue, and collaboration. From there, we'll go to uh, the very honorable Esther Penunia of the Asia Farmers Association. Uh, she's the Secretary, Gen Secretary General 
uh, of one of the largest global uh, federations of pharma uh, organizations representing farmers in Asia. And then lastly, we're going to Liberia, to Francis Collet, who uh, is the program coordinator and senior researcher for the Association of Environmental Lawyers of Liberia. So we'll get these different perspectives from um, a UN agency, from a data specialist organization, uh, from a very large farmers federation, uh, uh, and from a lawyer working on the ground uh, in a country in Africa. And then we'll, we'll, we'll open up a little bit and then we'll go into, uh, into a second round. Okay, so Esther, I'm going to start with you. I think we always need to start with those who directly work on and, and use the land and uh, feed most of the world's population as small farmers do. From AFA's perspective, what could you tell us in just a few minutes are the most immediate effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on your members. Over to you, please. Thank you, Mike. You are giving me this question at the right time because we just concluded a workshop on sustaining family farming in Asia Pacific, which was part of the Asia Land Forum convened by ILC, AR Now, APA, and STI with also the support of IFAD. We know six immediate effects based on these exchanges that happened during this workshop. First, increased displacement of landless farmers and indigenous communities. Migrant workers from cities domestic or abroad return to the provinces and their farms. And in cases where these returnees are landowners and local elites, they are driving out land displacing tenants and sharecroppers. And ancestral lands are threatened to be further encroached by lowlanders and even by local governments. Second, Additional pressures for land use. If they are part of the farming family, additional members put additional pressures for the land to be more productive so as to feed more family members. Mobility restrictions have made it difficult for family farmers to access input and supply, also limiting areas for planting and therefore reducing harvest in the future. In Fiji, for example, there are many new farmers because of the returnees and they need some capacities for technologies on sustainable production. Third is the suspension or halt of agrarian reform services by governments and CSOs. Because of the mobility restrictions and shifting priorities to COVID-19, activities related to land distribution and land titling to qualified beneficiaries and the corollary agrarian support services have been stopped or slowed down, further threatening the land tenure security of landless farmers. Fourth is with the pastoralists in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan because of travel restrictions, they had to change the route of their pastures and changing routes was difficult. And the COVID-19 has prevented pastoralists from going to or returning back from their summer pastures. Just two more. Fifth is the seeming giving of license to private companies and industries to come to the territories of local indigenous peoples. And sixth, during the COVID-19, Several land rights defenders and activities were threatened, arrested, or killed, as reported by colleagues in Cambodia, Indonesia, Philippines, sowing fear among the people. As democratic assemblies and mass gatherings are prohibited due to social distancing, the right to peaceful assembly is increasingly curtailed and the call for justice for these killings are ignored. Back to you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Esther. That's quite a sobering uh, list of, uh, of impacts, uh, resoundingly, resoundingly negative and, uh, and challenging. Um, you know, one of the things we do in ILC is, is we monitor, um, we contribute to monitoring efforts of violations against human rights defenders. Um, and we've um, logged 50 violations related to COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. Uh, and you know, I'm sure uh, in um, in your countries, uh, Esther, this is this has been, you know, the the heightened vulnerability of those who usually defend our common heritage um, in situations of lockdown. Um, let's go to Francis. Uh, Francis Collet is talking to us uh, from Liberia. Francis, I hope your uh, connection will be uh, stable enough. Just now, when we were testing it, it was good. Uh, unlike yesterday, when we we had trouble. So uh, let's go to you and give you the floor. Just to um, give us an idea from Liberia, do, did, did what Esther described for Asia resonate with you or are you seeing different impacts from COVID-19 in Liberia? Over to you. Francis. 
Francis, are you there? No, it seems like we may have temporarily uh, lost Francis. I'll jump, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Francis because I'd really like, I think it'll be, it'll be very important to hear from him. But let's go to Laura first. Laura, could you um, just give us um, what you've been hearing in the land portal? So land portal has been very active. I've seen um, a, a good number of uh, webinars you've organized over the last few months uh, on um, COVID and indigenous peoples, uh, on uh, COVID and, and food systems. Tell us a little bit about what you've heard in these sessions um, that, uh, that, that gives you a, a sort of picture of the data relating to, um, relating to COVID and land rights. Yes, <clears throat> yes, Mike, it's true. The demand for, for information has never been greater uh, during this uh, COVID-19 period and the Lamport is trying to do whatever we can. We established this land information um, hub on the COVID-19. Um, uh, most, most are anecdotal information uh, because it, yeah, as, you, as you know very well, you know, there is no uh, statistical or numerical evidences yet to measure this impact. Uh, but uh, we also try to uh, convene people in, in around webinars and discussions to really um, hear from them on, on real cases on what, what what is happening on the ground but I just I want just to report one concrete example uh, Mike from from South Africa from uh, from uh, from a uh, data <clears throat> Um, uh, one uh, um, example that described the need for for better data to to really um, uh, tackle with this crisis, um, we just concluded this uh, research in the, on the uh, study in South Africa on the availability and accessibility of land data, and the challenge in accessing quality and comparative data and information about informal settlements um, to support. Um, uh, uh, to tackle the pandemic. So um, what, uh, what came out from this research uh, is that despite the, the data exist and there is a great deal of data, so over the last uh, months during the epidemic, when it come down to managing the disaster response based on usable information and prioritizing the follow-up responses around addressing conditions in informal settlement, so the challenge of identifying up-to-date data about informal and rural settlements that could be coupled with data about the people living in such settlements has proven to be very difficult. So again, these highlighted the need for more institutional coordination around data sharing across state and non-state actors, but also um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the fact is that the data exists, um, but exists in pockets, often is protected, is not available in shareable, reusable formats. So it is incredibly difficult, uh, Mike, to clarify data custodianship um, and land related data set are so fragmented across jurisdictions and, and different departments and, and poor data publishing um, uh, practices uh, make the situation even more difficult. So this doesn't help using data to get a clear measure of the impact of this pandemic in the sector. So I just wanted to highlight this problem that is not just in South Africa, but is uh, happening in many other countries. So data is 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 very very um, important to help us measuring uh, the real impact of the crisis is having in the sector, and it is difficult to. Yeah. Use data. Uh, thank you, Lara. I, it's interesting what you're saying. I think I think what you're saying uh, of data is, is is reflecting what we what we see more widely in that in that the pandemic situation has really shown up the cracks in the system, hasn't it? It's you know we've 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 had shortages of data just like there there have been problems with um with food systems for example but when we arrive in the situation that we've come to this year uh those cracks become very visible uh, and and the implications of not having that data are all the more this is where we need that data in order to respond uh, appropriately so thank you for sharing that um there was a request from somebody in the chat to please share the link to that report uh if you had it if you have it, that would be great. There are a few more links we've put in the chat as well. We've put in um, a report that we did on from ILC on um, 
the role of land rights in uh, responding to uh, COVID. And I saw that Land Portal has put some other links as well. So please um, feel free to uh, go into the chat and, and download those and continue to ask questions as well. Now, I see Francis's uh, name here. Um, Francis, are you with us? Can we bring you in uh, at this point? Yes. Excellent. Okay, feel free to leave your, we'd love to see you, but, but maybe for the connection, it's better to leave your camera off. Uh, I don't know how much of uh, Esther's presentation you heard, but she was describing a very challenging situation for many uh, farmers uh, in her member countries um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and it's to understand from, from Liberia, uh, if you heard what she said, in what ways is the situation uh, that the communities that you're working with different or similar? Uh, what kind of challenges, in what ways are they feeling the impacts of the pandemic? Okay, Michael, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for, I mean, coming forward to listen to this, uh, this discussion. So, uh, we are working with our colleagues at the uh, Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. And we are following some very disturbing issues in the country, which um, is more or less arising because of the COVID-19 pandemic we have. And so together with them, we are documenting two activities. And of course, if you look at what is happening across our country and what you just explained, the impact of farmers is, 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 is great. And farmers are struggling more than ever before. Um, and so in our case, uh, regarding the work we do with, the, with our colleagues at CCSI, uh, one is linked to uh, this policy grant uh, in favor of uh, oil palm companies. So here, the government of Liberia is trying to complete a national consultation on the round table on sustainable palm oil, uh, the draft national interpretation for many people who have followed this, this oil palm story from Asia, like Malaysia and so. So that's the RSPO. And so uh, each oil palm producing company, especially those operating outside and also who want to continue trade with the RSPO process, they have to now do a certification process. And some of that will include like, uh, for example, working with countries back home. And in the case of Liberia, Liberia is trying to draft a national interpretation for the RSPO. So what is happening here is the government is trying to get this national consultation ongoing, but outside the free prior informed consent of the affected communities. And so the people whose, whose uh, ancestral land are being cultivated for oil palm, uh, those who our uh, areas are being earmarked for oil palm cultivations. These communities are still not able to participate because of the COVID-19. And if you find the government trying to get such an important policy up, uh, then it is something to worry about, especially uh, looking at how everything is tied to land, the livelihood issues. So that's one. Uh, the second one we're trying to document, uh, we document with our colleagues, is uh, the one linked to land grab, uh, in which a mining company backed by government is undertaking mineral exploration in an established completed forest. And this too is happening outside the free prior informed consent of the affected community. And the, the community forest was established in line with our uh, applicable Liberian law. And so this is something of serious concern to us as we work on this. But for many people who probably have not followed what happened in Liberia, I'll just quickly go over uh, a country contest so people can see this thing more clearly and can also relate more to the responses provided by my colleague regarding the impact of farmers. So first, Liberia is a post-conflict country. And in this country, like any other area where there's conflict, the tendency for violence is still very high, meaning we can still go back to war again. And then the next thing that happened to us is that after the civil war, we are still trying to build sustainable peace. Uh, it means that uh, we are not being able to effectively address the root causes of our civil war. For example, as a country, we have not been able to address the exploitation, the trade, the distribution and benefit of natural resources, which were all causes, uh, root causes of our war. 
And then uh, if you follow uh, our former president, President Ellen Johnson Salif, uh, she highlighted when she was in office that if Liberia will go back to civil war, it will be about land conflict. So that's something very serious. And then despite all that we know in terms of the impact community, the extraction of natural resources will find the concern of local communities. Our investment is to stay create economic activities, and we are doing this through foreign direct investment. So there's large scale mining, agriculture, and forestry concessions. So again, finally, why this is something very encouraging to help the struggling economy because it's going to create economic opportunities. Uh, it will raise the tax revenue, but in actuality. Uh, such a rapid investment has not been conflict sensitive. And right now in Liberia, it is becoming detrimental to sustain the peace. And so we are not being able to secure the delicate balance between the investment, the environment, and people. So this is our challenge. So it comes back to where she is. If people are not consulted when concessions are being awarded and their rights are being violated, water sources polluted, uh, loss of foreign resources that it depends on. Obviously, the impact of farmers, especially in the crisis that they uh, will be heavier than anything else. Francis, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for painting us a little picture. And I think what really struck me is uh, you, you've, you, you've described the post-conflict situation where a country is trying to rebuild itself uh, and is trying to uh, create economic opportunities to set raise tax revenue. Uh, but is doing so in a way that 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 is is falling heavy on the shoulders of the poorest, uh, and is actually dispossessing the poorest people from the biggest safety net uh, that they have. And as you described that, it it, it struck me very strongly um, the risk in so many more countries as we emerge from the pandemic, as as governments desperately try to kickstart their economies again and look for economic opportunity, that what you've just described happening in Liberia could happen in, in, uh, in so many countries. And so I think it's a very vivid example of the importance of, of securing land rights as we go into the, uh, into the recovery phase. You also came up with a very, uh, an interesting label I haven't heard before. You talked about policy grabbing. Uh, and, and I guess what you mean is, is the government pushing through policies very quickly in a period where they, 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 they might be otherwise be unpopular and there might be a, 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 um, some opposition to them. Okay, so we'll come back to that. And, and again, I'd encourage um, participants who are listening from the floor, if you have uh, experiences of your own uh, that are similar or different from what you're hearing, please share them uh, in the chat. And um, later on, we'll open up the floor and let uh, people talk as well. Okay, so let's go to our last uh, uh, panelist for this round, um, over to uh, Javier. Um, Javier, from your, your position in, um, uh, in FAO and your responsibility um, uh, in leading the land tenure division and, and particularly in supporting the implementation of the or the, the application of the VGGTs, uh, what do you expect from your bird's eye view to be the medium to long-term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I will let you point out the, the following. Uh, uh, first, uh, which is the, the most immediate impact we have seen so far, and, in, and we have heard from Esther, what has happened uh, in her region, in other regions as well, is the, la uh, the lack of access to land by a lot of uh, communities, farmers, indigenous communities, which means, again, uh, lack of access to their land and uh, in some cases evictions, and altogether has resulted and may result in loss of livelihoods, the, the means of, you know, you know to, to sustain their livelihoods, which in the midterm, long term may uh, result in increasing levels of poverty and food insecurity. A second point we have, uh, we are seeing now is the, is the reducing or closing of uh, land administration services at country level, uh, which means that there is a risk of increasing ir irregular land acquisitions. And so uh, that also means an, a, 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 the likelihood of increasing resource grabbing, particularly when it comes to forests, logging, legal logging. And so the, the reduction in, in, in land administration services will have 
a direct impact on tenure rights and access to resources, particularly by, 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 by the groups who, who are more vulnerable. Um, then there is another uh, issue, which is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the likelihood of lack of due diligence when it comes to land-based investments. Because in, 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 in an environment where we have poor or weak institutions, land institutions, then the likelihood of increased lack of diligence in, when it comes to land investment will be higher. And uh, another impact, uh, midterm, long term, will be, uh, and, I, and I think this is happening already, is less funding available to uh, support land governance services at country level. So, which means that we have to, you know, do the, you know, try to do the best of what we have already and increase our ability to uh, make use, effective, efficient use of the resources we have now. So, in this connection, I would like to, uh, when we open the floor for, you know, for dialogue with all participants, I would like to hear from our colleagues in Serbia. We have, uh, uh, we have here, I think, participating, uh, our colleague Darko Vucetic, Head of the Center of Excellence of uh, Information Management, Geospatial Information Management in Serbia, who would like to uh, uh, talk about and share their experience how, uh, how they have used land data during the COVID-19 pandemic and, and, and uh, to address the, the, the pandemic and also how to increase resilience for the future in the case of, you know, future uh, the crisis. And, and, and the other angle that I would like to highlight here is the need to use land, water, forest in a sustainable way to make sure that food systems are sustainable in the long run. And so in this regard, I, will ho I hope that we'll, in the conversation, we'll, uh, our colleague from the Land and Water Division, Vera Vera, will join to uh, share with us how, what tools, what instruments we will have to make sure that we can address the issue of sustainable land management and, and tenure issues with a, with, with a view to strengthen tenure rights in the, in, in, in the context of crisis, such as the one we have seen so far. Over to you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Javier. Uh, and a bit later in the discussion, we'll, we'll hopefully give the floor to uh, the colleagues that you mentioned. But I, I would like to bring to you a question which has come in the chat, which you may be able to answer, Javier. Uh, it's from Magdalena Kropovnik, and she asks, um, in light of, of calls in some countries, to put a moratorium on uh, land transactions during this time when it's really open to uh, to abuse on a big scale. Um, is this something that FAO has been approached to advise on? Is FAO in any way tracking moratoria on land transactions, large scale land transactions during this COVID pandemic? What can you say on that from um, FAO? Uh, so far, this issue hasn't been, uh, let's say, uh, brought up to us. And so, as you know, AFL, as a member state agency, uh, we work directly with, with uh, governments, with countries, and, and this particular issue hasn't been raised so far. And so, uh, I, uh, we don't have specific information on this, but, but it, there may be uh, in the future, but so far we haven't seen anything concrete on this matter. Over. Okay, thank you, Javier. I would encourage if uh, listeners uh, other participants, if you're aware of, if you have interesting information, for example, on this question that was just asked, uh, please put it uh, in the chat. So uh, you have a Q&A button at the bottom uh, and the chat uh, for, general, uh, for general comments, you can use uh, either. Okay, so we've, the, the four panelists have given us a bit of uh, perspective from their different areas of uh, work on the impacts. Um, we're gonna go now and spend um, the time left, which is the majority of time, um, thinking about building back better. Now, you know, building back better is, is how the Secretary General talks about the recovery from COVID. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that we don't go back to the old normal, but we create a new normal. That we've seen how many cracks there are in the systems that we've built. Uh, around food and land and climate and environment. Uh, and so this is our opportunity to, to rethink those uh, and to think how we can put in place something which is more people-centered, um, more environmentally um, uh, aware and climate sensitive, um, more 
addressing issues of inequality and, uh, and lack of democracy. And I think that's true in many sectors, but it's really true in the land sector, um, where we know that the wrong kind of in interventions in the land sector, even well-meaning, uh, can end up being damaging and particularly damaging uh, to the poorest who need those uh, protections most. Okay, so, so thinking about building back better and thinking about two phases of building back better that we have now, we hope, the immediate recovery phase, but in the medium to long term, we have, a long, we, we, we have the long term challenge of, of building resilience into uh, our food systems and, and other ways we use land and natural resources. So building back better, Esther. Uh, I'll come back uh, to you and and ask you for your for your view from uh, your member organizations uh, in Asia. You know, there's a lot talking now, a lot of talk about food systems and about healthy food systems. We're about a year away from the food system summit. Um, you're a champion, as I am, uh, of the food system summit. So we've we've both been involved with many other people in thinking through what comes ahead. And uh, I, one of your messages, as one of our messages from IOC is um, family farmers, small scale producers, pastoralists, fisher folk, indigenous peoples, really have the opportunity to be at the center of healthy, strong and resilient uh, food systems. So, so with that message in mind and with that vision in mind uh, about creating um, healthy, resilient, and equitable food systems. What opportunities do you see we have to do that, particularly with a focus on land rights? Over to you, Esther. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Mike. First of all, we would like to emphasize land rights to a small-scale family farmer, both women and men, young or wise, is basic. It is fundamental for a sustainable, healthy, equitable and resilient food systems. Why? Because land is a basic asset for farming. Without land, where do we plant? If we do not have the rights to the land, we cannot decide on what to produce, how to produce, where to market, where to get loans as we do not have a land title that can be used as a collateral for a loan. We will not invest in making the land productive because after all, as much as 70% of the profit will go to the landowner in spite of all our hard work and we will never know when our landowner will get the land from us. If we do not own our land, we do not have decision over its use. We will have very small portion of whatever profits we may get from the use of the land, even if we do all the hard work. So there is no justice there, right? No equity there if we have no rights to the land. But rights, ownership, and stewardship of the land is just the first step. To have sustainable food production as a farmer, we, may, we need to make this land productive, not only for some years, but for many years to come, for the next generation, for our children. Thus, we must have sustainable, climate resilient, integrated, diversified, organic, biodiverse, agroecological systems, whether it is in lowlands, uplands, or forests. We must practice sustainable pasture management, sustainable agriculture, sustainable forest management, integrated water management on our lands. And because our land is part of a whole ecosystem, we must get other farmers in our areas to also do sustainable climate resilient agriculture. Because for example, if you want to grow organic corn, but the other farmer one kilometer away does farm sprays pesticide, our organic farm can be affected. The irrigation waters running through our own farm can get infected. And then sustainable food systems is also sustainable processing, packaging, marketing, and distribution. If we own our land, we can put a processing facility, say a community-based rice mill, community-based machine for grating coconut. We do value addition, which can increase the market price of our product and therefore our incomes. If we have rights to our land, we will be free to join cooperatives that will facilitate processing, packaging and marketing and distribution of our products. And joining cooperatives will facilitate more equitable distribution of wealth among its members, us. So, Mike, please allow me to state our recommendations at this stage. Uh, we, because uh, for sustainable, resilient, equitable systems, 
we ask governments to secure rights to land for small-scale farmers, pastoralist herders, forest dwellers, indigenous peoples, and water rights to small-scale fishers. We have the CFS voluntary guidelines of the governance of tenure of land, waters, fisheries, and forests, as well as the responsible agri-investments. We ask governments to apply this in the national laws. Provide incentives and support for sustainable, climate resilient, biodiverse, integrated, diversified agroecological systems. Provide incentives and support for sustainable processing, packaging, and marketing, supporting more local food systems and local market hubs. And please, to recognize the role of family farmers by strengthening multi-stakeholder approaches and mechanisms for agriculture and rural development, making family farmers through our organizations and cooperatives equal partners in the design and implementation of agriculture programs, particularly with the implementation of the UN Decade of Family Farming at the national and regional level. So with the UN Food System Summits, we look forward to multi-stakeholder member state dialogues at the national level where we can articulate and design the transformative food systems in our countries and in our region. Back to you, Mike. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Esther. I, I really like your, your very holistic uh, approach to say resilience is about um, uh, environmentally sustainable methods, strong institutions, strong links between, uh, between farmers. And I think it, it's, that, it's that holistic perspective uh, which I hope will be a very strong message into the Food uh, System Summit. And, and all of that has as, at its basis land and natural resources. And I should emphasize not just access to land, but really management, isn't it? It's, it's management of those resources in a way which brings benefits to people and, and to the environment. Okay, so we're going to go over to Francis. I would just encourage you before we, uh, before we hear from, uh, or while uh, we're hearing from the next speaker, have a, have a look at the chat. There's a lot of very interesting um, information going in uh, about this idea of a moratorium. Um, it's been called for in some countries what the response has been and, and whether FAO, uh, the role that FAO could play if it was, if it was able to, to hear governments more easily. Have a, have a look at that. Um, Francis, uh, if you're online, we're going uh, we're gonna to come back to you now. Uh, and, um, you know, you described uh, a, an effort to rebuild uh, uh, rural economies and societies and food systems in a post-conflict situation, you know, and I guess I guess what we're in now uh, and coming out of uh, the pandemic will be again like a post-conflict situation, and so and so you'll be maybe trying to restart and revitalize what you've already been been trying to do. But give us a bit of an idea um, how land tenure is part of your vision and the vision of, of communities and local organizations that you work with for creating better and more resilient um, food systems uh, coming out of COVID-19. Over to you, Francis. We can't hear you, Francis. I see you're unmuted, but um, we're not hearing your voice. Okay, uh, Francis is going to hopefully uh, get reconnected as he successfully did uh, just now. And while we're waiting for Francis, I'll, uh, I'll jump to um, Lara. So Lara, you gave us some interesting perspectives uh, on, on data. Uh, I'm going to hear from you. After you've spoken, I'm, I'm going to go to the floor and I'm going to ask for our colleague from Serbia to be ready to uh, to give us his perspective. But before we go there, uh, Laura, what needs to be done uh, to ensure more effective and transparent land information systems uh, coming out of COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation? Please. Well, what, what, what we think is that um, land data need to be better governed because when they are well governed and available for use, for, for instance, to, to monitor the impact of the pandemic, no? there is a range of actors that can, um, can have access and use the data, then that's the path to 
public good. So they can, they can really become useful for um, better public services and, 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 and better decisions. So um, the government departments who are the main custodians of, of data and responsible for maintaining and making data available, but of course also uh, private um, organizations or research institutions, and including civil society organizations, they all need support to do a better job to improve the overall uh, information uh, ecology and, inf and improve data sharing because data sharing is really, really important because everyone is is producing a small uh, portion of the data but to, to really have the the, the, the full picture uh, we we need to uh, um, uh, correlate data um, uh, compare data and put data together so data sharing is is really the way the way forward so the the, the state of land information research that the land portal is, is doing at the country level in several countries is is a particular effort in collaboration with local uh, research institutions. It offers um, a picture of, of what is available in the country, but also how this information is accessible. And also it offers concrete recommendations that can go in the direction of um, um, suggesting uh, more um, collaboration across uh, jurisdictions of information departments. It can go into, uh, for instance, um, clarifying custodianships because, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 to, 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 to understand what government or uh, what department is, is responsible for the maintenance of, of a certain database. Or it can also go in the direction of um, uh, um, enforce the use of um, um, pub good uh, publishing practice not to, to, to include metadata or user standards. So to, to, all that is needed to improve um, um, uh, interoperability, so data sharing um, and the clarifying and mapping this ecosystem, what is, a, what is available in a country and how accessible data is, is the first step to improve um, towards a, improving the, the, the whole uh, information ecology and generate more transparency and, um, and also um, um, data for decision making. That's the first step towards um, uh, uh, using data, uh, especially in these difficult crises, in these difficult moments. Thank you, Lara. Uh, let's. I think a very good lead-on from what you said would be would be an example. Uh, I would ask uh, if we can if we can bring from the floor Mr. Darko Vucetic, um, who was introduced by uh, Javier. Um, he is the head of the Center for Excellence for Geospatial Information Management in the Geodetic uh, Authority of uh, Serbia, uh, and I'd like you. If you, we just give you uh, two minutes, please, to give us an idea of how you're, you're using data to establish uh, a risk re register uh, and how your government is using that to overcome exactly the kind of uh, challenges that Lara was, uh, um, was explaining to us. Over to you, uh, Darko. Thank you for being ready to share with us. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Hi everybody, I'm very honored to present my, my institution and uh, our uh, response to COVID. I am referred to uh, Laura's uh, um, um, uh, speak and also Francis and I, I am coming from an institution who is responsible also for uh, cataster and property registration, mass valuation, utility cataster, so I can um, reply also for this land transaction during the COVID. So it's very interesting results and I would like to, to share it with you. Uh, the first regarding data sets, uh, my center of uh, excellence for, for spatial data infrastructure, we call it like that, is um, uh, built uh, some um, uh, geospatial hub, on, uh, central hub for all uh, public uh, sector data, geospatial data, which is available to everybody. Um, but uh, in 2016, I would just re refer to the, to the quality of this data, half of the citizens was, was without uh, proper address and uh, four and a half million uh, buildings and properties were not registered. So we used our new technologies like geospatial platform with combination of, uh, of crowdsourcing and uh, all data sets to update those data. And also what is very 
important and I would like to underline here is about uh, business processes, for example, for land transaction and updating of this data. And um, uh, we, in 2016, we saw that it's a very big problem. It's an analog business process. So we changed the policy, many, many laws, uh, introduced di di digital signatures, include uh, in innovative technologies in order to digitize these processes. The result was astonished. Uh, from uh, 20, uh, 47 days uh, needed for this land transaction, we came for four days. Why it's uh, so important? It's because when COVID-19 started, Serbia and my institution were, uh, let's say, ready for this. Government uh, established two working groups, uh, led by Prime Minister and President of Serbia for health and so uh, social uh, affairs and economy. And uh, digital platform and uh, data hub uh, together with all these streamlined uh, business processes were uh, extremely critical infrastructure for smart and efficient decision making. So uh, every week, for example, we provided the uh, uh, exa information of real estate market information for a previous week and providing enough data and information to the decision making for Ministry of Finance and so on to adapt their policies and re recommendations for, for, uh, for, uh, for this uh, uh, real estate, for example, market. And thanks to all of this, real estate market were able to recover in April. It was, uh, with compared with 2019, were minus 78%. So it's a huge decrease. But in, uh, and in only one month after, in April, in May actually, it was plus 30% with compared with 2019. And my recent information shows that uh, even in this uh, year of COVID uh, situation, this year will be uh, regarding these number of transactions and the amount of money you know, for land, uh, land transaction will be uh, the, the best, uh, best year year in the last 12 years. So it's very important to say. Our geospatial platform is also adapted to support COVID decision making. It served uh, and data within and end-to-end -end, uh, um, services, digital services, served for gov government institutions and local municipalities to guide, for example, lockdown, to provide all data to make activity for agriculture, for small far farming and so on, in order to, me uh, to not to stop field activity, but to ensure protection and safety of, uh, of uh, citizens. So uh, what is the, the best, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a positive person, you know, in the nature, so what is the, the, the positive, you know, um, uh, conclusion here? Because uh, um, even we had uh, in uh, last year, for example, these digital, digital uh, processes and digital services, uh, our citizens, uh, because of habits, you know, they go, went, went on, the, on the local offices and uh, waiting in the queue. After this uh, uh, COVID lockdown and uh, all this situation that uh, goes, uh, it was uh, for us very uh, happy to see that there are no, so everything is electronical. And also we want to, uh, to introduce new risk register, new information system, which will serve not only for COVID like, like this, but also for other disaster risk management and reduction processes like uh, landslides, like uh, all others. And I would like to thank FAO because all this, uh, we work together with FAO and with the guidelines. And uh, I will share with, uh, uh, in, uh, in chat, uh, our recent paper to, uh, you know, made together. So you can, you can see in more details all these uh, uh, facts that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vishitic. That That's a very um, tangible, uh, example of being ready with the data and the systems that when uh, when the pandemic came uh, you could ensure on the one hand I guess um, an orderly continuation of transactions and avoiding some of what we heard from some of the other speakers of um, increased vulnerability to land grabbing but at the same time uh, have a much quicker uh, recovery so thank you for that example if you have any links please put them in the uh, in the chat so that we can uh, we can follow up Okay, um, we're going to try again with Francis. Francis, are you with us? Yes. Excellent. Please tell us what building back better will mean for, for the organizations that you work with in Liberia. Okay, thank you and Sarah again for being offline. So, um, I'd like to just quickly go back to um, when you try to like, you know, repeat some of the key points that came out from my first presentation. Uh, exactly the issue of uh, grabbing policy and land without the consent of the affected communities is not conflict sensitive. It is not conflict sensitive. It only depends the violation of the commercial rights 
and they are built to secure sustainable livelihood. You know, so for us, we see real difficulties in rebuilding their lives after the COVID-19 for our communities. So uh, like I highlighted before, before I get to the key recommendations we have, our communities are gonna like wake up after COVID-19 and they will find their voices were not heard in the validation of a key policy document that will define the oil plant sector for generations and also affect their control and management of their land and resources. For the communities that are highlighted regarding mining operations in the community forest, even where the community members have control over their own land and forest, and they were dreaming of introducing community enterprises, when they wake up, they're going to find that everything is lost. So just to go back to some of the impact we see happening, uh, increased loss of access to farmland and forest resources on which everyone is aware local communities depend on, uh, the issue of scarcity of water sources due to pollution, and of course, they, we see the environmental impact. So clearly from our point, um, the, we will now have to be very careful, for example, that the results of community consultations will have to be followed very far. Uh, we are aware, number one, that there, there's now a potential for one-sided information in which the negative externalities of investment uh, are not being communicated to the affected communities. This is always a common issue. The communities we live in and we work in, the companies we see, when they come to our communities, they are only talking about the benefits of the investment, the roads, the schools. They're not talking about the negative impact, that there will be loss of access to farmland and communities will not be able to grow food. They're not going to talk about pollution of water sources. So this is something we need to watch out for. Uh, we got to watch out and keep an eye on company manipulation uh, through divine root tactics. Uh, companies often divide citizens, they divide them up into yes and no groups, uh, cleverly preventing the affected communities from speaking as one group. This is something that people should watch out for, especially after COVID-19. Uh, people got to know that uh, they, 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 there's also going to be the absence of a support system. Uh, where local communities were supported by their NGO partners and their community lawyers. So if consultation is not possible and participation not effective, these support services are not going to be there. So it's good to keep an eye on them. So that aside, moving forward in terms of what we need to be looking at, uh, how do we ensure food security for our people? The first one we say uh, is to encourage the companies to go beyond the business case to invest in a particular country, especially in a conflict affected area. They have to go beyond the business case to include the social case. And the social case will take into account all the implications for how communities are going to survive once there's an investment. So it means that the issue of food security are issues that can be thoroughly investigated and integrated into all the different strategies the company is going to introduce to roll out their investment. So going beyond the business case is the first one, and ensuring that there's a social case to any investment is something very important. Then two, we will encourage companies at all time and government at all time to ensure human rights due diligence, and, and they, should, they should have emphasis on conflict sensitive issues, and also the issue of gender sensitivity. This kind of due diligence issues are important and we think they are issues that we need to prioritize going forward in this COVID. Uh, because all we believe companies can do better and they have the resources, they have the technical capacity to do this. So we are urging them uh, to work with the governments to keep doing this. Um, the next thing is I think for us going forward is we need to be looking at how to address the definitional issue regarding what is consultation and participation Many people will overlook this, but it's good to have a clear definition regarding what constitutes community participation and consultation. Because we have not been able to talk to the communities, even within COVID. We are so worried about them. But we've been aware, they've been talking to us, that they too are affected by COVID-19 and are having some second thoughts regarding how they want to participate in processes out there. So it is good to ask them, in this case, how do you feel consulted and how do you think you are participated in a particular consultation? 
So that's why we say go forward to talk about the issue of the definitional issue regarding what is consultation and participation, but asking the community to set this definition. And also we think uh, we need to work on policy reform clearly, and policy reform will take into account the type of consultation that are possible and legal during a pandemic like this. When far we need to have a serious conversation on the policy direction regarding what kind of consultation and particip uh, participation can we work on and prioritize? And how do we use that as indicator to determine that seriously people were involved, they were consulted, level of issue, the food security issues were all addressed. And then Thank you, you Francis. Okay. Thank you, Francis. Uh, th that's super. You've given us a, already an extremely uh, broad and wide ranging um, agenda, which sounds like a, a huge challenge, but, but I think also at the same time, we appreciate the, the many fronts, the accountability, the building positive uh, partnerships, um, every aspect of, uh, of what needs to be done in order to have a mutually beneficial um, relationship with investors. Okay, we're going to hear from, from a, a, another uh, community level uh, in Ethiopia in a minute. We've got a, we've got a great um, experience from Ethiopia to share, but before we go there, uh, let me just come back to uh, Javier. There's been quite a lot in the chat about the VGGTs um, and I guess uh, the RIE as well, uh, the Responsible Agricultural Investment Guidelines are, are, are very uh, pertinent. How do you see the next phase of, of building back better, uh, particularly with relation to what's already been agreed in these agreements that the Committee for World Food Security has helped to, uh, to broker. Uh, and how, how can those be real um, uh, guides for countries to get back on track uh, and, and to build back better than they had before in, in terms of land tenure? What would, what would FAO say uh, should be the way for them? Okay, thank you, Mike. I will point at two issues. I would like to bring your attention to, to all the colleagues. One is, it is once again, it's confirmed the need to secure tenure rights, particularly uh, by the most vulnerable groups, small farmers, women, women, indigenous peoples. And to do so, we have a good news. We have now new technologies, we, which we can use and deploy at country level, which are inexpensive, uh, such as, you know, open tenure, for, for instance, this application, this is an example only, there are others. Uh, they're inexpensive, which means that we can reach out a larger number of people, of farmers, in a re relatively uh, short period of time, as opposed to the traditional surveying programs done in the past, by which surveying was done and then the, the, the land registration was done uh, afterwards. Now we can do uh, faster and cheaper. And the other thing, there are participatory, which means that communities themselves participate in uh, identifying uh, boundaries, and that decreases the level of land conflicts and disputes, and we, uh, which allows to a faster uh, process of land uh, regularization. So one thing, is, uh, one, that's one point. We need to now think about new approaches to regularize tenant rights, and we have them. Uh, and so uh, we have some uh, evidence already that works. I again, it's, it's an expensive, participatory, and that I think we can move on as, build, as we build back. The other point I would like to bring to your attention to is that we already have also ongoing processes in a number of countries, uh, which are, I see quite, quite a, a, a great partner on this, uh, multi-stakeholder platforms. Because to engage private sector, to engage government agencies, to engage other partners, we have to have a mechanism to, which facilitate that engagement and create a consensus to move forward. Because each country has its, its own features, its own opportunities and challenges. And those are sorted out at that level. And these national, national platforms, multi-stakeholder platforms, which are coordination mechanisms which you discuss policy, ranging from a land titling to a land investment, how to deal with investors, private investors wanting to invest in the land, how to partner with them. And this kind of dialogue, policy dialogue, is well, very well placed within these platforms which are already operating and we can build upon and leverage as we build back in the future. Over to you, Mike. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Uh, uh, and we're going to go to Ethiopia now, but I would, I, I've noticed that we have a number of donors uh, who are participating. I see uh, there's BMZ, there's DFID, uh, there's USAID. Uh, and I would invite any of you that want to give us perspective as a donor to complement what Javier has just said uh, and um, uh, share a little bit about uh, what role donors might play in, in supporting a building back better. So put up your hand if you'd like to say something. Uh, you have a bit of time to think because we'll go, uh, we'll go first in this final section as we open up the discussion uh, to a colleague from Ethiopia. We're very uh, fortunate to have uh, Dr. Ziade Hailu. Uh, with us. He's part of the Land for Life Consortium uh, in Ethiopia. Um, one of the things that Javier just mentioned is multi-stakeholder platforms and the idea of having a mechanism that allows a wide range of, of stakeholders, of people who, who have a part uh, in decision making over land to be part of that uh, decision making. Please tell us uh, from what the Land for Life uh, initiative in Ethiopia has been doing. What do you see as the role of civil society and particularly multi-stakeholder platforms in helping to build back better? Ziada, over to you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, good evening, others. Uh, well, uh, in Ethiopia, we have been engaged in uh, multi-actor multi partnership because uh, we believed uh, uh, a thing like land, which is very complicated, cannot be solved by a single organization or single individuals. So what we are trying to do is basically bring on board all stakeholders uh, the, there could be farmers, there are people from academia, from government, from business people, and sit together and plan out how to solve problems such as uh, land, uh, uh, land issues. So uh, we are trying to be a voice uh, for the voiceless in Ethiopia, a credible organization that uh, speaks out on behalf of uh, the poor people when land right violation happens and so on. So uh, we also try to engage in a policy uh, dialogue with the government. For example, uh, the Ethiopian government has come up with a 10-year development plan. We are, we are almost ready to, to give a structural response, mainly to keep land on the agenda because uh, we in Ethiopia are passing through a transition and the government has a lot of priorities. So we make sure that government focuses where it has to focus because as we have seen, the land issue is, uh, is, is about food security, about nutrition, about peace and all that. So that is basically what we are trying to do with support from our colleagues. And hopefully uh, after some time we'll be a very strong organization uh, engaged in, state, in, in advocacy and all that. So another question, Mike, is uh, what should be, uh, what are the roles of uh, civil society organizations in this difficult time? In my view, the COVID has revealed uh, really what the CSOs are made up of, whether they are, we are made from sterner stuff or something else. But I see three main uh, contribution that CSOs can uh, engage, can help uh, so that land rights uh, sh should be uh, on a map where they should be. And the first one I think is engage in service delivery. Another contribution that CSOs can do is uh, in terms of education and outreach. And thirdly, on advocacy. Let me say a few things how uh, civil society organizations can help in service delivery. Um, the, in terms of uh, land administration institutions, uh, civil society organizations can help so that uh, the, the land administration can engage the public health dimension. For example, in their activities, they can use water, sanitation, masks, and all that can be supplied. I can also uh, think of a service delivery that they can capacitate court mediation institutions for effective dispute resolution, because as we know, for the past six, seven months, there has been dis a disruption in these institutions. They can also uh, provide uh, legal aid for the poor people, especially for women and vulnerable population. In terms of education and outreach, um, most people, especially people who cannot read and write, do not know what their land rights are. 
And civil society organizations can be instrumental in teaching people, in educating people what their rights are, and also legal education. In terms of advocacy, uh, in my view, uh, civil society organizations can advocate and lobby so that fair land laws are in place. And as uh, Javier was saying, that there has been disruption in oversight and land, land administration oversight. And these institutions can demand improved oversight by district officials, by regional governments. And there are a lot of unresolved boundary and ownership issues uh, for the past many, many months. And civil society organizations can play a role so that uh, the government really puts land on the agenda and try to solve all this. Thank you very much. Back to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hailu. I think uh, a, a very practical uh, perspective from, uh, from Ethiopia. Um, okay, we have, uh, we're lucky to have uh, from the floor, um, I've just brought him, uh, brought him into the panel, um, Chris Penrose Buckley uh, from the FCDO, I think uh, the ex -DFID. I don't even know what that stands for, Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, maybe Chris, you'll, <laughs> you'll say, but we'd love to hear your perspective as a donor that's quite active on land issues. What do you see, uh, Chris, as the role uh, for donors uh, such as yourselves in building back better on land rights? Over to you, please. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, and it is uh, the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, just for clarity, former DFID. Um, so I, I think this is a really important question. Better um, term is, is, is kind of a useful thing to, 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 to gather around, although I think when you, when you drill down, um, I'm not sure it hasn't been kind of broken apart. Um, I think what, what COVID-19 has done is highlight how weak land governance systems are, right? And how fragile rights are in so many contexts. What I don't think we have yet is push to really tackle it and address it. But I think we, we and uh, uh, other um, bilateral donors and multilateral organizations and with ILC have been having a conversation for uh, a while now trying to say, well, how, how do we need to redefine the case for investing in better land and the recognition of um, what, what do we need to do collectively rather than just working in our own silos to really get this on the agenda and really get a concerted push to, uh, to get governments and all actors to start taking this more seriously. I think, I think the building back agenda is, is important and is maybe a useful hook, but obviously there are so many other issues that are also being pushed into this whole new agenda about how to respond um, better to this crisis and it's a crowded space so i think we really need to think harder about the narrative around land and how we uh, address this i think in the coming year there are some really important opportunities around the food systems summit uh, the cop 26 agenda with a growing uh, focus on land use uh, in the context of climate change. So I think, I think we really have an opportunity next year to, to, to get this on the agenda, but I think it's gonna take some hard work um, and willingness by donors, civil society and other organizations to, to work together in a more joined up way um, and to think about a more focused narrative that really makes the case to global leaders and to national leaders that this is something that we need to do. So that, that's a fairly high level response to your, your, your question, Michael, but I, I think this is a really important agenda that we need to uh, grasp. And I think there are some opportunities uh, in the coming year. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and what you're saying actually relates to a, a great question from uh, Chris Hagedon, who's the CFS uh, secretary uh, in the chat. Uh, about how we make the VGGTs, which have been mentioned quite a few times in this discussion, uh, more impactful and and real uh, at the country level. Because I think I think what's behind Chris's question is the fact that we've been working, we've had the VGGTs for seven or eight years, but but as we hit a crisis like this year, we, it really is apparent how much has not been done in securing land rights. So we've agreed on what we should be doing. 
but in in essence, we failed to do this to do it. Uh, and I think you know, if we take what Chris was saying just now, um, as we look ahead, perhaps the challenges seem even bigger because because the world is will be so concerned, is concerned, and and will continue to be concerned with the real immediate crises uh, that it's facing. Um, COVID nineteen today, but but. Uh, and hopefully in a few years time we get out of COVID-19, but the climate crisis, uh, you know, as we said at the beginning, is is really here to stay uh, and, and will require a huge amount of attention. Now, within the land community, of course, we believe that the land is absolutely fundamental to addressing these bigger crises, but unless we find a way of of keeping that, uh, keeping attention on land, uh, we may find that ironically, um, the solution that we offer, which is which is really a, a systemic solution, uh, is overlooked for for the more uh, immediate and urgent um, uh, challenges that governments are occupied with. Um, does anybody would anybody like to um, comment on on uh, Chris's question? And his question is is basically should the CFS uh, be doing more? Um, to make the VGGTs more impactful at country level? Or is it enough to leave it to, to FAO, um, other ILC members, uh, EFAD, World Bank, etc.? cetera? Um, is there more that we can be doing in, in this urgent time to be applying the VGGTs? Let me, let me open it up. If anybody from the floor wants to speak, uh, please put your hand up and we'll, I'll see your hand. And uh, um, I see we have uh, uh, Mr. David Numanlo. Uh, I'm not sure if you're answering this question, but I'll give you the floor, David, and um, allow you to uh, to please contribute. Uh, go ahead, David, and then if anybody else would like to talk, please also put your hand up. David, are you there? Uh, if I could ask the, the comms team to put, uh, give, yes. I see you. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mike and uh, panelists. Could you lean a little bit closer to the mic because it's a bit uh, faint? All right. All right. Can you hear me now? Great. Thank you. Um, I, I just I just want to indicate that the the voluntary guidelines seem to uh, be less uh, disseminated, especially in in rural communities, and so in as much as it's uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's intended to create impact, to, to build on the people's knowledge, to, to enhance the community's uh, involvement in securing land rights. It's, it, it, it's a little bit not known to rural communities. So um, in order for us to, to build back better, there needs to be a lot of a, a, a dissemination program that will, will entail uh, reaching out to the communities and making them see a sense of ownership in this document because um, uh, at the level of uh, at country levels there are there are ongoing land reforms um, I'm talking from Cameroon and uh, there is there's been an ongoing land reform but it's 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 uh, it's maybe not certain if the principles contained in the voluntary guidelines have been uh, disseminated wide enough or taken into consideration in the process of, of land governance. Now, we in Cameroon are living in a context of, uh, especially in the English speaking regions, we are living both in a context of COVID and in, a conf in the context of an armed conflict which has been going on for four years. Uh, that has seen uh, hundreds of uh, communities displaced. Some of, most of them have lost access to their means of livelihood and uh, they are basically trying to find access to, to land in, in their, their host communities, which are not their original communities. And with, with all of that, and with the fact that they've lost means of livelihood, they've lost investments, they've lost businesses, they've lost employment, it even becomes very difficult for them to be able to, to have access to land rights. Uh, Cameroon in particular is, is uh, specific because its procedures for land titling, for example, are a little very, very complex and, and involves a lot of corruption and bribery. So we, civil society... David, I'm going to have to... Can, can you wrap up? Okay, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just saying that civil societies need to be able to take action 
to, to explain the procedures to the community so that they can in turn uh, make informed decisions. And that's a way of building that method. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, really a fundamental message that, that maybe, maybe we're not seeing so much in some countries on the voluntary guidelines because they just don't know. It's the non, it, they're not well enough uh, known. Uh, I'm going to go to Esther, uh, our panelist uh, from AFA, um, and I'm also going to ask uh, Viera Berger from uh, FAO to be ready uh, to come in after Esther to, to give us also a perspective on the VGGTs. Esther, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mike. So just to respond to your question about the role of CFS no, in promoting VGGT, I think the CFS is like uh, E5, FAO, and WFP at the global level. So we have been calling for a decentralization and maybe a nationalization of CFS processes where at the regional level and at the national level, E5, FAO, uh, WFP come together and also help, help, uh, and then the CSOs, which are in the CFS global level, they are participants in the, in the whole process of making policies. So regionalize, decentralize the CFS processes where all the multi-stakeholders are there. And of course, what uh, the, our friend has said, education, especially on the rights, the rights of the people and the laws that, that they have, and the, and the gaps that these laws have if we compare it to the principles of the VGGT or the RAI. And over of this, it's the, C, the CSOs, uh, they, they should be supported in terms of organizing these people, the indigenous peoples, the landless, so that they are able to know their rights and have the capacity to negotiate, especially with governments and with the uh, landowners or the big companies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think the clear message from both of you is is that the, the, the VGGTs become relevant uh, when when uh, there's interest, there's momentum, there's pressure from from different sectors. So it's not just the role of the government, but civil society organisations, farmers organisations, community organisations have a big role in in. Um, bringing to life uh, what's in the VGGTs. Uh, there's a very interesting comment from Julian Kwan in the, in the chat, um, who, who's building a bit on what uh, Chris Penrose Buckley was, uh, was saying earlier on, um, that uh, as we look to the future, possibly um, addressing land rights for the sake of land rights will not, be, uh, will not capture enough attention. And we need to be much cleverer at uh, promoting the work we do on land rights for the bigger issues uh, that that, uh, that contributes uh, to. And for that reason, Julian is saying the CFS is very well placed um, to take that approach because the CFS looks in a, in a holistic perspective uh, at, at things like food systems and so isn't isolating land rights out of those bigger issues. Uh, thank you for that comment, Julian. I'll go over to um, Viera from FAO to please uh, add us, give us an additional perspective on VGGTs, particularly this question of we have the VGGTs, why aren't they being uh, more applied? And then I'll go over to Magdalena uh, Kropovnica from the floor after Viera. Viera, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Yes, uh, actually, um, the request from, from the countries or the, the decisions taken during the UNCCD COP actually show us that, uh, and, and these uh, decisions were taken with a lot of support from the civil society representatives, they show us uh, that uh, the parties have understood or, or that they see uh, that tenure security is very necessary in order to achieve land degradation neutrality and also to, uh, to achieve the sustainable management of land. Uh, and the current pandemic uh, shows that the sustainable land management and land tenure security are needed in order to, to avoid the emergency of, of this uh, dis, uh, zoonosis and to protect, protect the most vulnerable people from its effect. Actually, in order to achieve LDN, or land degradation neutrality, countries need to, be, to set effective land use planning mechanisms which serve against encouragement of human activities into ecosystems to, uh, to be protected. And, and that will also help in, in the, the race of poverty um, which is linked to the pandemic. Actually, the, the VGGT um, 
the, the, the guide which, which FAO is now helping to, to, to develop in order to, to, uh, to link the VGGT to land degradation neutrality uh, is, is based on, 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 on countries which have already uh, in good practices or good, uh, good um, examples of, of where the VGGT has been working and where they have been implemented. So that will be formed the basis for the guide which will help the, the parties which uh, have uh, committed to, land, to, to achieve land degradation uh, neutrality, which is the uh, SDG 15.3, to use the VGGT in order to achieve this land degradation neutrality. So that will give it another uh, input, uh, I mean, for, for using the VGGT. Yeah, exactly. It gives some momentum. I, I think that's a very timely intervention in the light of what we've just heard, that, that possibly we risk we risk losing momentum on the VGGTs, the promise of, of it having a higher profile in, in the UNCCD is, is, a, is a very positive one. Thank you very much for, and probably for raising that. And climate change convention, hopefully. Uh -huh. that, would be a, that would be a very significant um, uh, step forward. And in fact, we saw from the, the UNFCCC report uh, some months back, uh, attention on, uh, on land for the first time. Good, thank you for raising that. Right, we're, we're coming near to the end of our time, so I'm going to give the floor to Magdalena, and then we're going to turn back to each of our panelists for closing a statement. So I'm afraid Magdalena is going to be the last person from the floor, but please do use the chat if you want to say anything. Uh, in the Q&A section, there's an interesting uh, question on land, on digitalization of land records, whether it in fact helps or possibly hinders those most uh, vulnerable to losing their rights. Have a look at that. Um, so carry on in the chat if you want to, but we'll go over to Magdalena. Uh, Magdalena, the floor is yours. Um, thank you to um, CFS Secretary. Thank you, Chris, for this very pertinent question. Uh, in two years, we will have uh, 10 years. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? We can hear you very well, Magdalena. Okay. Carry on. Um, in 10 years, we'll have the um, 10, I mean, in two years, we'll have 10 years since the, uh, um, and I, I mean, since we finally passed the voluntary guidelines. And uh, frankly, my perspective um, is, is quite interesting because have not, I, I have left Rome exactly, you know, eight years ago. And when you step out from the land community, there is still persistent lack of knowledge uh, outside about voluntary guidelines on land tenure uh, on country level, especially here in the Caribbean where I am now, but also where I was posted previously in Uganda. Um, there, outside of the people who are land practitioners and who are directly involved with land tenure issues, there is complete lack of knowledge about that tool. So I think there is still a lot to do. Um, but I also wanted to stress that there is an opportunity in COVID uh, in a certain way in terms of democratization and access to spaces. Um, the example of this session, for example, of the side event, when we are 100 people here, which very likely we wouldn't have the same, avail the same access and the same level of participation if not for the digital opportunity of participating via webinar. So I think that's something that um, all of the organizations, CFS, perhaps also working uh, in closely with other organizations dedicated to data, such as Land Portal Foundation, you could use that to uh, really push the advocacy, but towards the governments, because I think civil society knows how important VGs are. It is the moment that the governments embrace it and perhaps have some kind of reporting mechanism um, that you could explore together with, uh, with others. I would strongly encourage that and it should happen very, very soon, but also hand in hand with increased advocacy and communication towards governments, I believe, because very few countries so far have uh, adapted VGs and have used VGs so far. So I think there's a, there's a vast, vast area there that needs to be uh, worked on very quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Magdalena. Uh, and have a look at the Q&A chat. There's a, quite an interesting um, uh, idea from René Chatre that, um, that land tenure could be built into as a condition for uh, lending in the recovery uh, phase by uh, IFIs. Okay, uh, we're very close to the closing and I'm sorry that we're gonna have to, um, to cut the discussion uh, off here. It's been extremely interesting, uh, but we're gonna have uh, literally 30 seconds each. So uh, I let's just hear from each panelist 
what is your one most important takeaway message uh, from this uh, discussion on building back better uh, and land tenure, um, uh, the role of land tenure in building back better. I'll start, I'll go in order of who I can see on my screen. So be ready, all of you. I start with uh, Javier. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the, the message that I would like to convey is that COVID-19, as Chris Buffett said, has shown how weak our uh, land administration systems are at country level. And so, uh, but the good news, after eight years of the CFS endorsements of the CFS of the heat is the good news is that we have tools, we have approaches, the instruments to build up better, to make them better and to build resilience for the future. And so to do so though, is we need to the support of the CFS membership. As we have seen the success stories are those cases where we see a, a full commitment by civil society, by the private sector, by government, all, all, all main stakeholders to implement the VGT and to really improve awareness of tenure. So the message is the 47th session of the CFS that is coming up in, in, in February next year will be a great opportunity to reinforce the, C the VGTs to, re the, to recommit members, the other membership to continue working on them because they are key to achieve the SDGs. Without secure tenure rights, without sustainable management of food systems, then we'll, we won't be able to meet the SDGs, the 2030 development agenda, a bill the resilience that we need to deal with future crises, such as the one we just are going through. Over. Thank you, Javier. So the VGGTs are more relevant uh, than ever, and we need to be very uh, strategic and decisive about how we keep attention to them uh, in the light of uh, many competing priorities. Esther, let's go over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mike. So my takeaway is that the secured rights to lands, forests, pastures, even waters, by small-scale family farmers is fundamental to achieve sustainable, equitable food systems. And therefore, and therefore, a multi-stakeholder approach with people, with the farmers, the indigenous peoples, the pastoralists at the center, driving, driving this process, but with the support and with the political will of the governments and with the support of international partners is key. We have many tools. It's the will that is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And uh, I'll see it's 100% uh, behind you, Esther Nambar. Uh, and I hope that message comes out strongly between now and the Food Systems Summit. Okay, the next person on my screen is Laura. Laura, please give us your um, you, takeaway. Thank you for that extremely interesting session. My takeaway is that um, what we need to be vigilant uh, about is that data is treated as public good. So I would like to see more conversations on how data sharing and, uh, and knowledge sharing um, can help building back uh, better and, and build, build um, collaborative digital environments. I, I, I know that half of the population still don't have access to internet. So so we need to be uh, conscious about that. But digital platforms can really promote information in a democratic and inclusive way and create a space where trust and agency are ensured and democratizing access to uh, land information. Uh, so um, we're working in that direction and uh, I hope to see more um, of the collaborating partners uh, working with us too. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. A reminder of, of what a powerful tool data can be uh, in, a, in a time ahead where we desperately will need tools to help us to move ahead. Okay, let's go over to Francis in Liberia. Francis, your takeaway, please. Okay, so um, for me, uh, I think uh, putting communities at the center of investment, especially during this pandemic, is very much important and it's a key takeaway point. And it means that we have to ensure their right to food security, especially communities that were already vulnerable before we had this crisis. I think this should be a key priority for us. And then we need to obtain their consent in decisions that will ultimately affect them today and tomorrow. 
and quickly regarding the VGGG, if you look at what is what we got there, it is almost what every country looking for now. Many countries are struggling with land tenure issues, and this is just where every country should be going to find some solution. So in terms of moving forward, we need to invest in awareness raising of the developmental relevance of the VGGT. So for example, at the country level in Liberia, not many people are aware of what really it is and what it can do in any way. So some kind of uh, investment in awareness and education regarding the developmental relevance of a VGGT is important. And I agree with my colleagues, tying that around the work of civil society, uh, you have to know that, for example, when you had the EIT, I mean the EITI, the Extracting Industry Transparency Initiative, civil society had to really take the lead on a number of these fronts. So in our country, like here, if you have civil society taking the lead in a number of ways with government champions, I think we can have some. Another point about the right. is that thank uh, you, Francis. Uh, okay. I want to give the last yeah. one about his <laughs> You're taking know. away from, from Zaid Ziad's time. Okay, if you I'll give you five seconds to finish and then we go five over seconds. to Dr. Hilo. The last yeah. one on the VGGT Marco is we need to incentivize countries that are implementing the VGGT. Let's incentivize country so that they can implement the VGGT. Our country respond to incentive. So a structure like that will work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Francis. Sorry to cut you off. Uh, Dr. Hailu, you get the last word as the, as the last um, panelist to give us your message. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, the takeaway for me is that the collaborative multi-actor partnership can be an interesting advocacy strategy for inclusive land governance. And also um, the takeaway is that, that we need to introduce technology to the rural population because this is what COVID has shown us. We need to move from cashless transaction to sort of low touch economy. And uh, the last is uh, I have a praise for uh, the digital platform and I guess I go and write a poem in praise that we are able to be together and understand, share ideas on land rights. Thank you very much, good night. <laughs> Thank you for those closing words and appreciation of a uh, of, uh... A digital platform that brings us together from across the world. So uh, thank you so much to uh, an absolutely fantastic group of panelists for the many, many uh, speakers and contributors in the chat from the floor. You know, I think just my one reflection on this discussion is, is that in a sense, we haven't said much new, have we, than, than even if we had this discussion before COVID. We're saying at the center needs to be um, an approach in which communities play a lead role, which takes the VGGTs that works together with, with governments in, in making them real, uh, which recognizes tenure rights. So, so in effect, what we're saying is that the pandemic has made us realize that perhaps we've made less progress than we'd hoped to make and the urgency of, of moving ahead strongly uh, is, is absolutely there. And I think one clear message as well out of this is that the CFS really has a strong, strong role to play because of the way that it brings different stakeholders together and enjoys the trust uh, of, of government. So certainly as IOC, the VGGT is, is, remains a, a very strong um, guiding document to the work of, of all of our 250 members. Uh, and uh, we will be working our best over the coming years as we get out of COVID to keep it at the center. And uh, from what's been said here, I believe uh, many donors will um, and many other organizations. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a wonderful discussion. It's been really great to hear everybody and it's been a privilege for me to be uh, moderating it. Thank you so much. Goodbye, have a good evening. Thank you.